let's call today Prophecy Basics, What Everyone Needs to Know. If you don't know the basics, then this is going to be kind of confusing. And we got to start right here. Go ahead, Chris. Truly, the most important basic of all Bible prophecy is Israel. Amos 3, verse 7 says this. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. Um, we have done a systematic study on the major prophets. Those are the big ones, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and Jeremiah. Plus, we have teachings on verse by verse through all of the minor prophets. Those that are under the age of 21. I wish I would never say that, but it just... The minor prophets, the ones that are smaller. We have done verse by verse studies through them all. You need to know something that Israel is very important because why? They're cooler or God loves them more. Israel is God's chosen people because he's saying, hey, watch these guys. And you're going to see a lot about who I am. When they believe me and my Bible or my prophets, it goes quite well for them. They're supernaturally protected and blessed. And then all the world goes, why are you guys doing so well? And they're supposed to say, because there is a God in Israel, and his name is Jehovah, and this is what he looks like. But also Israel is a standing example that if you don't do what I say, then I'm going to remove my hedge of protection, my supernatural series of blessings that comes with obedience. And then all the world is supposed to see, wow, Look how God is pulling away their safety, so to speak, and then, boy, do they go through it. And also, and so important, is Israel is the central key to understanding all Bible prophecy. Now, does the church sort of have some fun prophecies regarding it? Of course. But never, keep, never um, take your eye off the ball. Israel is so vastly, vastly important. So important. From Abraham to King David... <clears throat> from Nehemiah to Netanyahu to Jesus ruling in the millennial reign, Israel is the key to understanding what has been going on through all history and what is about to come. If you would, would you turn in your Bible to the book of Daniel chapter 9? Um, I have a little marker. In fact, my Bible falls naturally open to Daniel chapter 9. We have spent a lot of time in Daniel chapter 9. And for many, this will be a review. But for those of you who perhaps are sort of new to the ministry here, um, if you don't get Daniel chapter 9 understood correctly, uh, your Bible prophecy can go astray quite quickly. Um, if you know that God is in control and that even Israel, when, even when they weren't a nation for 19 centuries after the Romans destroyed Israel in 70 AD, if you didn't know that, this could be upsetting. So I wanted to see this verse. Uh, we're in Daniel chapter 9, but if you would, write somewhere near and maybe put it on a sticky somewhere. Um, especially in the coming days when CNN and Fox News and all the other outlets, outlets they're going to be showing some pretty rough stuff. Isaiah 26.3 says, You, God, will keep him in perfect peace. Who? The dude or dudes whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. No matter what is happening to Hamas and Israel, um, I do want to show you this. Uh, did you know that the term Hamas, which of course does not represent all the Palestinian people. Be careful to lump uh, large groups of people in with any group. Hamas is a relatively small group. They are a terrorist group. Everybody has declared so, even the United Nations. Hamas is an acronym and it means, it means in Arabic, Islamic Resistance Movement. It's five Arabic words. The first letter of each word spells out the acronym Hamas. Now, Arabic language is a bit different from Hebrew. They're close cousins, but they're a different language. I found it fascinating this week. Did you know that there is a Hebrew word, Hamas? It occurs 39 times in the Old Testament, and most often it is translated as violence. Wow. Go ahead, if you would, Chris. 
Genesis 6, verse 11, And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And the earth was also corrupt before, the, before God, and the earth was filled with violence. That word in Hebrew is Hamas. I find that fascinating. Matthew, what is it, 24? In the last days, it'll be like the days of Noah. And there will be violence on the earth. That is Hamas. Fascinating. Uh, go ahead. Here's Psalm 7, verses 14 through 16. Behold, the wicked brings forth iniquity. Yes, he conceives trouble and brings forth falsehood. He made a pit and has fallen into the ditch which he made. And his trouble shall return upon his own head. And his violence, Hamas, dealing shall come down on his own crown. The New Testament will sort of say, um, I'll paraphrase loosely, God sees to it, what you reap, you will sow. Now I want you to keep Psalm 7, verses 14 through 16 in mind as you see these awful, awful images. Does Israel have to eliminate Hamas? Yes. Why? Because of what they constantly do. Why can't they sit down and negotiate? I showed you last week probably why. The Palestinian stance uh, pretty much as a whole. But Hamas specifically, do you know that you cannot sit down and negotiate with anyone who is determined to kill you? Does that make logical sense? So Hamas is counting on that, and what an awful group of leaders they are because they want their own civilians and innocents to be killed so that they can broadcast that throughout the world. Harvest know that that day is coming. Please remember that Ecclesiastes chapter 4, there is a season and a time for everything. There is a time for peace, negotiation, if you will. But there's also a time for war. And we took you through last week that Hamas is probably mentioned specifically there in the battle, the prophetic battle of Psalm 83. And we looked at that last week and where that fits. But I want to show you today kind of an overview of, of the whole thing. I want to go through Israel. Go ahead with our, our next slide, if you would, Chris. Um, here goes Steve and his timelines. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm a comic book kind of guy, and if I can see it, it just makes more sense to me. Here we go. Here's the basic Israel timeline. And why Israel? Because they are the stopwatch of the Lord. The whole planet is supposed to be aware of what goes on in Israel. So Israel really starts with a fellow by the name of Abraham. Abraham has a son, Isaac, and Isaac has a son, Jacob, and Jacob has 12 sons who become the 12 tribes of Israel. So that's really important. The next kind of really important time is this. Go ahead. This is Moses. Moses, of course, he is called up by God because the children of, of God, Abraham's seeds, are now sort of uh, in a pickle there in, in Egypt. How'd they get there? Well, God had them go, through, go there thanks to Joseph, son number 11. Well, 400 years after Joseph um, saves Egypt and the rest of the world from famine, uh, a new pharaoh arises that doesn't know uh, Joseph, and he is awful. And he puts the uh, people of God, the Israelis, into terrible, terrible bondage. 400 years after 70-ish or so go into Egypt, 400 years later come out a nation of about 2 to 3 million Jewish people coming out of Egypt, and that's all under Moses. And then he has those seven feasts, if you're not familiar, seven feasts of Moses. They start three in the spring, three in the fall, and one right there in the middle. In the spring you've got Passover, the blood of the lamb, and then the angel of judgment will pass over, okay? And then the next day there is um, unleavened bread uh, celebrated for seven. That's an idea or a model of no sin. And then uh, you find that Sunday, and then you find that that is first fruits. Then in the middle you have Pentecost, roughly our early June. And then in the fall you have trumpets, 
Then you have Rosh, pardon me, you have uh, Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement. And then finally you have the Feast of Tabernacles. We've been noting for quite some time that those seven feasts are all prophetic. What day was Jesus crucified on? Passover. If you didn't know that, you better check that out. He didn't die on the 13th of the month of Nisan. He didn't die on the 14th, pardon me, pardon me, the 15th of the month of Nisan. He died on the 14th. It was a model. The blood of the lamb. Now if it's on the doorposts and lintel of your heart, you, the angel of judgment, will what? Pass over you on judgment day. And Jesus was the sinless one, unleavened bread. And what day did Jesus raise on? A Sunday, first fruits. Paul went, ding, I get it. Jesus' resurrection is the first fruits of them that slept. Then in Pentecost, can you think of something interesting that happened on or around Pentecost? The church was born. Go to the fall. We believe that the last three, trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles will be prophetic as well. Well, that all gets set up with Moses. And from about uh, 1400 B.C. is when they go into the promised land, Um, Do I have that up there? I can't recall. I got Abraham, I got Moses. Who's next? Yes, the promised land. Roughly around 400, God says, all right, this is your land, 12 tribes of Israel. And they go in under Joshua. They kick out the usurpers that had been there in their 400 years of absence. And then they begin the land of Israel. Then you're going to get to Solomon, you're going to get to King David, and then you're going to get to your Bible's depiction of of, um, kings and chronicles and so on. And that all takes place there. Very important. Now the next most important date is this one. Go ahead. At about 606 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar from the Babylonian Empire, he comes across and he destroys eventually Jerusalem and exiles the people of God, the Jewish people, for 70 years in Babylon. You can read about that in your book of Ezekiel and, of course, the book of Kings and Chronicles. That was a really important time. Now, God had said to Jeremiah, he said, now they're only going to be in exile for 70 years. And then when they come back 70 years later under Nezra and Nehemiah, Nehemiah, you can read about that, of course. They come back into the land. They rebuild their temple. Eventually, Solomon takes that temple and makes it bigger, cooler, nicer, and with LED lights and the whole thing, you know. He uh, um, zhuzhes up that temple significantly. That's the temple that Jesus would visit that you can see in the depiction there in the, in the uh, Gospels. All right. Now, the next most important prophetic thing to happen in Israel is this. Go ahead. 32 AD, Jesus presents himself on Palm Sunday as the Messiah of Israel. We've got lots of teachings on that. He was there exactly to the day that Daniel chapter 9 said he would be standing there. Palm Sunday was the 10th of the month of Nisan. You go back to Exodus 12. Yeah, what did they do when Moses was around? God says on the 10th of Nisan, you select your Passover lamb. That's the day, the 10th, that Jesus is standing on the Mount of Olives. As you know, it's called the triumphal entry, but it wasn't particularly triumphal. Jesus stops the whole parade, if you remember the story. And he begins to weep over Jerusalem. And they're all, you know, what's up, Jesus? Look, we're waving the palm branches. We're laying our coats down. We're singing Psalm 118. Blessed is he, Messiah, who comes in the name of the Lord. And in fact, didn't the um, scribes and Pharisees say, Teacher, stop your disciples. Why? Because they knew that everybody in the crowd was saying Jesus is Messiah. But Jesus stops that wonderful day and he says, oh, Jerusalem. 
I know it's coming down in about the next few minutes. Right now, you all are on my side, but I'm going to go on down the Mount of Olives. Oh, by the way, Ezekiel in exile, five-ish hundred years in front of these events of Palm Sunday, Ezekiel sees over to Jerusalem in the spirit. He sees the glory of the Lord go out of Solomon's temple to the Mount of Olives and then raise right out of sight. For us non-Levitical thinking people, that's an image that the glory of the Lord because of Israel's sin and idolatry had left. Israel from what mountain? The Mount of Olives. Palm Sunday, what mountain is Jesus standing on? The Mount of Olives. The Jews had every right and reason and every example and model in the scripture to embrace Jesus as Messiah on that day. It was the 10th of Nisan, the day they're supposed to select their Passover lamb. He's standing there exactly 173,880 days to the day that Daniel 9 said he would be standing there. And as a rule, what did they do when Jesus goes down into the temple of the Lord? And instead of kicking out Romans and beginning the millennial reign that they were all convinced it was going to happen, he turns over the tables instead and he says, Look what you've done to my father's house. He made it a place of merchandise. And as a nation, Israel said, you're not our Messiah. And on Palm Sunday, they rejected Jesus as Messiah. That's why Jesus wept. You didn't catch the day singular of your visitation. Well, as you know, uh, within a few days after Palm uh, Palm Sunday, pardon me, uh, the next... Four days later, he's rejected. Four days later, he's on a cross. He dies for all of our sin. And then he resurrects on Easter uh, Sunday, or Resurrection Sunday. And then he hangs out for another 40-ish days. And then he goes back to the Mount of Olives. The resurrected, new-bodied Jesus is going to ascend from what mountain? Olives. When Jesus comes back, Revelation 19, and touches down on the earth, just take a wild guess where and what mountain his foot will land on. Say it with me, the Mount of Olives. Okay, there's your real triumphal entry. But let's get back to our study lesson. Now, go ahead with our next slide. Let's focus on this. Now, from Palm Sunday, uh, soon after, you're going to see Jesus crucified. You're going to see him resurrect. And then you're going to see the second chapter of the book of Acts. On the feast of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is poured out upon those 120 in the upper room. And that is the beginning of the church of Jesus Christ. uh, Filled with the Spirit, all the gifts of the Spirit are in operation And then the church is going to grow. Now, when will the church age end? Nobody knows. But here's when it does end. It ends with the rapture of the church. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, I got to show you this date. This is important. In 70 AD, just as Jesus prophesied, did the Romans lay a siege wall around Jerusalem? They did. And in a year's campaign, over a million Jewish people are systematically slaughtered by the Romans. It's all in your history books. You can check it out. All of that was prophesied by Jesus and in other locations. Well, what happens to Jerusalem? Well, it's destroyed. Well, what happens to God's people? They are scattered throughout all of the planet. And that is also prophesied in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 28, right around verse 64, if I can recall. So the Bible says and promised even before they got into the promised land under Joshua. If Israel, if you would just do what I say, it's going to go wonderful for you, but you won't. There's going to come a day, says Deuteronomy 28, that I'm going to have to scatter you to all the nations. And that's what happened in 70 AD. Not a 70-year stint in Babylon. 
Now this is going to be 19 centuries of scattered throughout all the planet. Then this happens, very crucial. Go ahead. This is probably the most important uh, prophecy basic you have to get down. In 1948, UN decrees that Israel is going to become a nation. Talked about it last week. That's huge. And in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus said, the generation that sees that happen will not all pass away until Revelation 19. Are there people alive today who were alive in 1948? Some of y'all are sitting in the room. Here's the promise, and here's why it's kind of important we go over this. Yeah, weren't people saying Jesus was coming back, I don't know, World War I, World War II? Yeah, that's true. But you have to understand something. Before 1948, there was no nation of Israel for the prophecies of the book of Daniel, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, and the book of Revelation. Is there a nation of Israel now? And Jesus said, the generation that sees 1984, let me rephrase, when Jesus comes back, Revelation 19 to the Mount of Olives, that's after the seven-year Great Tribulation, there will be people alive who were alive in 1948. We catch a lot of heat on that one, Blake, but I believe that's what he said. All right. Now the next most important stop on the prophetic uh, landscape is this. Go ahead, the rapture. What is the rapture? I want to show you this. I'm, trying not, I'm going to try not to take too many rabbit, rabbit trails, but I want to show you something. Would you, I had to go to Daniel 9. Keep your finger, Daniel 9. And would you make your way over to the book of Isaiah, chapter 26. It's a pretty popular thing. <laughs> you crazy Christians in your rapture. Did you know that the whole notion of rapture was cooked up as of late? And depending on what group you're talking to, maybe it was even the Council of Nicaea 325 or as late as, and they may late date some even to the 1850s. Did you know that there's no such thing as the, as the rapture in the Bible? I want to show you something. Are you in Isaiah chapter 26? I'll be there soon. There we go. Chapter 26, please. You need to know something, that if it's very important for God's word and God's revelation, there will be a model for it in the Old Testament. Now, Isaiah is written 700 B.C. Is everybody okay that the next verse we're going to read was written way before Jesus was born? Check it out. You're in chapter 26. Look at verse 19. Your dead shall live. Does that sound like resurrection language to you? Together with my dead body, they shall arise, awake and sing you who dwell in the dust. What's another sort of reference for those taking a dirt nap? They are said with me, dead. For your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. That's the Hebrew word nephal, and it means, it's the root, to be thrust forth with great force. Do you know what the Greek equivalent to nephal or cast out is? Harpazo. What is the Latin equivalent of this Hebrew word nephal? It is rapture. A lot of people don't know that. You crazy Christians with your rapture thing. There's no rapture in the Bible. Please remember that the Latin Vulgate was the primary sort of reading material, thanks to the Roman Catholic Church, for a very long time. And that word, you shall not all sleep, but you shall be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye, book of Thessalonians. And, and God will come down with a great shout, and then out you come. That word for snatched away in Latin is rapture. And the name stuck well before all these other people like, oh, rapture wasn't even dreamed up until some guys in the 1850s. No, because anyone who knew their Latin Vulgate, they knew that rapture was coming. And the name rapture stuck. Now, you and I read English translations of 
of Greek. And so the Greek word there is harpazo. So when somebody says, you know, the, the word rapture isn't even in the Bible, you're right, in Greek, but is it in Latin? Yes. Sorry I make that point, but I want to make that point. Read it with me. Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust, dead people, for your dew, for the dew, for your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Come, my people. Right in your margin there, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. You want to see a videotape of the rapture? It's Revelation chapter 4. And what does God say to his church? Come! Do you see this with me? This is not me stretching the scriptures. Come, my people, enter into your chambers. John 14, verse 2. Jesus says, in my Father's house are many, and English translations is mansions and some, but the real word that Jesus said was chamber. Why? Because he's referencing, hey, y'all, check out Isaiah 26. And shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment. And I wrote my margin, seven years. Why? Because where is the church in the 70th week of Daniel? In heaven, until the indignation, and that word is wrath of God. All right. Also write in your margin here, uh, Genesis 5, verse, I believe it's verse 23. Um, you can make your way back to the book of Daniel. If it's important in the New Testament, there will be a model for it in the Old Testament. Is there a model? of God snatching out the righteous before an obvious move of his wrath. Yes. Genesis chapter 5. Uh, Adam begot, uh, begot um, oh, I can't think of his name suddenly, Seth, etc., etc., etc. And then you get to a fellow by the name of Enoch. Strange, the Bible, you got to see it. Hold your finger here in Daniel chapter 9. I got to show you guys. Please look at this. I want you to be able to see it turn anybody to it because it's out there uh -uh, there's no rapture and did you know that Peter said that was going to happen that in the last days scoffers will come and say where is the promise of his coming it's never happened before Genesis chapter 5 please um, verse 3 and Adam lived 130 year, 30 years he begot a son in those likeness and named him Seth now skip down to the book uh, to verse 21 and Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah, etc. Here we go. I meant verse 23. So all the days of Enoch were 365, and Enoch walked with God. In the Old Testament, before the cross, was the presence of the Lord a scary place? It sure was. But we got this guy Enoch, and he's walking with God. Fascinating. He walked with God, but he was not. For God took him. Verse 23. And Methuselah lived. Whoa, whoa, whoa. God what? He said with me. Took him. Why? Put your uh, Old Testament glasses on. In Enoch's time, there were three groups of people. Because God was going to judge the world with a great flood. How much of the world was going to be judged? All of it. Why? Because of their sin and idolatry. So in Enoch's day, there were three groups of people that were about, that were, that the great judgment was almost there. There was one group of people who were not going to listen to Noah's preaching while he was building that boat for over a hundred years. What are you building that big boat for? The ocean is way over there, dummy. And Noah is saying, because God's going to make it rain. And remember, it didn't rain like it does today. Ha! Rain? You're, dude, you're, you're drinking your bath water. You're nuts. So that group of people will not believe the warning of Noah. And they are going to perish in the great judgment. There's also a group of people, very small, who do believe God's promise of an impending world why judgment? That's Noah, Mrs. Noah, and the three boys and their wives. And inside the ark, they are supernaturally 
spared through the great judgment. That would be a model of Israel. There's one more group. It's one fella. He is going to be taken out. Say it with me. Can you see it louder so the tape can hear it? He's going to be taken out. Can you say it louder? He's going to be taken out. I'm just saying. Before, thank you, baby. Now, Daniel chapter 9. And as you're making your way over to Daniel chapter 9, there's another model. Um, there is um, Lot. For some crazy reason, the Bible says that Lot, who had very little fruit, but Lot was a righteous man. My only supposition is he must have believed his uncle Abraham and followed Abraham around while Abraham built a number of altars. That's the only way I can make sense when Peter says that Lot, when he was living in Sodom, it vexed his righteous soul. So he's a righteous guy. So there's Abraham. And then remember those three dudes stroll by his tent one day. What's up, Abe? He goes, hey, fellas. And in a true sort of a hospitality of the region, he invites them in for some lunch. Two of the fellas keep walking. Abraham goes, where are they going? And the third guy says, they're on the way to Sodom and Gomorrah because they're going to judge it. Really? Now Abraham knows, where is my nephew living? Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham says, well, uh, would you, would the Lord God? Now I get it. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, they're pretty awful folks. And the idea that God would judge them after they would not listen evidently to, to Lot or who else was talking to them then I get you're going to judge them. But would you judge that old city if there were, I don't know, 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah? What was God's answer? Nope. Oh, cool. What if there were 40? Nope. 30? Can I hear 10? 10, 25, 10. And it would seem by inference, what if there's only... Now remember when those two angels show up there in Sodom and Gomorrah, one of the things they say a lot is we got to get you and your family out of here because we can not judge them while you backslidden carnal blot until you are, say it with me, taken out. And now there's others, but let's get back to our story. I want to continue with the timeline. So, Jesus starts the church in Acts chapter 2. The Romans are going to scatter the Jews all over the planet in 70 AD. 19 centuries later, Israel is going to return, thank you to UN decree. And Isaiah 66 verse 8 says in one day Israel is going to be a nation again. Now the next most important thing is going to be the rapture. Please don't write me, put your thumbs away. People still try to convince me. Did you know that it's, it's mid-tribulation rapture? It's post-tribulation rapture. My simple response is, you have to show me the model of a mid-wrath mass exodus of the righteous. It does not exist. You do not see God judging righteous people in the, in the face of a very large-scale judgment. You do see a model of God taking out the rapture, Enoch and Lot before. Now that said, the rapture is going to happen, and then next will be this. Go ahead. Then you're going to have what the Bible says is the seven seals of the book of Revelation and seven uh, uh, trumpets and seven bowls. Is there a model for that? Pastor Steve, the book of Revelation isn't seven years. Yes, it is for a number of reasons. And is there an Old Testament model? Yes, it's Joshua. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, and you know how long it took him to rid God's land of the usurpers? Seven years. We have a teachings on the book of Joshua, and did you know, if you have your Jesus glasses on, did you know that there are parts of the book of Joshua that are an outline of the book of Revelation? If that blows your mind, check it out. All right, so that's seven year of the Great Tribulation. That's what your book of Revelation is. Go ahead. Another way to think of it is Daniel's 70th week. We're going to go here in just a minute. Go ahead. 
At the end of the seven years, Jesus returns. In fact, Jesus says you can count the days from the abomination of desolation, which is the midpoint of the seven-year tribulation. Exactly, count it up, 1,260 days. Then he also says 42 months. And he also says a time, a times, and half a time. Three and a half years. Do you see that the Lord is saying from the midpoint of the great tribulation, when the Antichrist throws off, I'm a good guy to everybody. The Jews have embraced him as their Messiah. He got them a temple built. He made a covenant with them for seven years. But in the midpoint, he changes his stripes. He puts a statue of himself in the holy of holies. Hey, did that ever happen? Didn't we just read Amos says that God does nothing until he tells the prophet first? Is there a model of a terrible man setting up God idol worship in the Holy of Holies? Yes. It's a fellow by the name of, of um, a fellow by the name of Antiochus IV. It has happened. Check it out. Look into the history of Hanukkah, and you're going to see that God actually allowed an actual dress rehearsal. It happened. It's going to happen again. And God says, by that time, Matthew 24, when you see the abomination of desolation, you have 1,260 days, three and a half years, until I touch down Revelation 19 on the Mount of Olives. There it's laid out for you. Let's hear our go button. Then what happens? Then the millennial reign of the Lord begins. What's the millennium? How long is a millennia, you guys? It's a thousand years. Now, why is it a thousand years? Is that an arbitrary time? No. There's the whole map. For those of you who want to snap a picture, this will be on our, um, this will be on our website. Now, go ahead. I want you to notice something. God's Bible and his prophecies all have models. They're all there. He's never going to jump out from behind the, the uh, prophetic bush. Boo, you know. Man, I wasn't expecting that. You need to know something. One of the very first models that God ever institutes it's in the book of Genesis. You work how many days? And then you rest the seventh. You have these, these Sabbath days in the Bible. There are Sabbath weeks in the Bible. There are Sabbath years. I want you to notice why, because what's the pattern? Eternity passed. We don't know how long that, well, it went for eternity, didn't it? Until the Lord says, I'm going to make planet Earth. And he makes Adam. Start the watch. 2,000 years later, here's Abraham, and those dates are not arbitrary either. They're in the Bible. We know how long these guys lived. Then from Abraham to Jesus, that's another 2,000 years. What's 2,000 plus 2,000 plus 2,000? Six. You work how many? And you rest the? Notice that the millennial reign, more or less, is God taking all of the demons and incarcerating them, that's all Revelation chapter 20, for a thousand years. And some people still try to say, "Uh uh-uh, not like a literal thousand years. It's, you know, a symbol. No, it's not. The Bible says, how long, you guys? A thousand years. Now, I want you to notice that 6,000 plus 1,000 equals what? And that's judgment day. Does it surprise you that that pattern would show itself in all of eternity? Uh, let me show you this too. Go ahead. Now, there in that little section, that seven-year period, there's where your uh, book of Revelation in the seven years of the Great Tribulation happens. That's to give you a basic idea. Uh, hit our go button again. That should take us back to our previous slide. All right. Uh, hit our go button one more time. All right. Now you're in Daniel chapter 9. Did you make a little sweat spot right there where your finger's been? Okay, good. So now your book will open there too. Daniel chapter 9, please. There is the background. It is all about Israel. Do we see that Israel is the Lord saying, you want to know what's going to go on? Watch Israel. And nobody did it better than Daniel chapter 9. We're going to start with verse 20. Daniel chapter 9, verse 20. What's happening here, this is around 540 B.C. After 70 years in Babylon, now you remember that, that's the exile, Daniel is writing from Babylon. 
He knows that Daniel, or pardon me, Jeremiah chapter 25 said, y'all are only going to be there 70 years. And then God is going to let you go. So here he is, 70th year in, in Babylon. Uh, Daniel knows his Bible and he's saying, okay, Lord, time is up. What now? Now, Daniel 9, verse 20. Now, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, that would be Zion. Remember, at this point, Zion is in ruins. There's 70 years in exile. It has laid fallow. From Babylon, Daniel says, verse 21, Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, that's an angel, he's an announcement angel, Gabriel pops in and out of human history a couple times and he always has a big announcement. Then Gabriel showed up, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, that was Daniel 7, being caused to fly swiftly. He reached me about the time of the evening offerings and he informed me and he talked with me and he said, Oh, Daniel, I've now come forth to give you skill to understand. Verse 23, at the beginning of your supplication, the commandment went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved, therefore consider the matter and understand the vision. There are two prophets the Lord said were greatly beloved, and they both had to do with the book of Revelation. Um, Daniel is one. Can you think of the other apostle whom Jesus loved, who wrote the book of Revelation? Just saying. <laughs> Daniel's about to receive the most important revelation in the Old Testament, the entire outline, let me say that again, the entire outline of the end times, you got to get this one right, otherwise you'll get goofed up. Verse 24, 70 weeks, is that seven day periods? No, the word there, weeks, is Shabuah, and it means simply sevens. Seventy sevens are determined upon your people. Is your people, Daniel, 450-some B.C., is your people, I don't know, the church in Sparks? Who is Daniel's people? Israel. Now, there are people that get it mixed up, and they think that the church is going to go through the seven-year Great Tribulation. No. It's gonna, you're going to see here in a minute that this is the 70th week of Daniel, and the church is not there. Why? Enoch, they've been taken out before. Lot, they've been taken out before. Daniel chapter 9, this is a prophecy about Israel. If I can't say it any better, I'm going to say it again. The church will not be in the, the seven-year tribulation. All right, don't write me. Uh, you just learned that in the last whatever. No. Let's keep reading. Your people, who is Daniel's people? Israel. And your holy city. What is the Jews' holy city? Jerusalem. Is it New York? Is it Rome? No, it is Jerusalem. To finish the transgression. Now notice, not transgression. A singular transgression is in the heart of the Father. When Israel basically says, oops, and repents of that singular transgression, I'm coming back. And you know what that singular transgression is? It's when they rejected Jesus as Messiah on Palm Sunday. Okay? To finish the transgression singular, to make an end of sins and to, rec to make reconciliation a good word there in Hebrew, it's the Hebrew word kafar, and it means to make atonement. How do you make atonement for sin, everybody? Innocent what? Blood. For the iniquity, and to bring in, literally to cause to come in, everlasting, interesting word, meaning ages, everlasting righteousness. That last little line should be to cause the righteous ages to come in. To seal up, we would say, put a seal on it. It's done to complete vision and prophecy. By the time this is done, almost all of the prophecies concerning Israel will be completed. 
and to anoint the most holy. What's another way of saying the most holy? Messiah. Okay? Remember, this is all B.C. To begin Messiah's millennial kingdom and reign. Verse 25. Now, know therefore and understand. So crucial. End times Bible prophecy is not hard. It is not esoteric, and only the biggest, deepest studiers will get it. It is so easy. Get this one, Harvest, and understand it. That from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. What's seven plus 62? It's 69. Now I want to show you this. All right. Hit our go button if you would. Here's a blue line. 606 B.C., they get taken away into exile. How long are they going to be there? 70 years. There's going to be a decree. You all can go back home. If you do your homework, you're going to find there are four such degrees, one of which is in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. But the one specific decree, Cyrus was the first one, and only 50,000 left exile in Babylon. Oh, we got it too good here in, in Hot Tub City. Babylon was so sophisticated mathematically, astronomically, and engineer-wise, they had hot and cold running water, if you could afford it. It was a highly advanced society. Okay, y'all can go back and rebuild Jerusalem, you know, and we like it better here in Hot Tub City. We're not moving. Only 50,000 go in that first wave. The fourth and final one was by a fellow by the name of Artaxerxes Longimanus. It's a well-known date in history. It's March 14th, 445 B.C., that is a decree that specifically says rebuild Jerusalem. And that's our boy, Nehemiah. And the Bible says there's going to be seven plus 62. And it seems that seven sevens, or 49 years, it's going to take them to rebuild the temple. Then keep it rolling. Hit or go button, if you would, Chris. So 69 weeks are 483 years. Is everybody okay with that? It's going to be 69 weeks, something is going to happen. Now, how many weeks total? 70. When the first 69 are done, how many weeks is that going to leave? Just one. Well, when does that happen? Hit the go button. It happens here. That's why the book of Revelation I call the 70th week of Daniel. And it has to do with what group of people? Israel. And what city specifically? Jerusalem. Does that look sort of easier laid out this way? Now Daniel's going to go into this uh, last week a bit more in detail. Verse 25. Know and therefore and understand that from going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, that's Artaxerxes Longimanus, until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62, or after that 69th week. The street shall be built again. It's talking about Jerusalem. And the wall, even in troubled times. Write your book of Nehemiah. That's what that book is all about. Verse 26. And after the 62, really, the seven plus the 62, really, after the 69th week, by the way, uh, the prophetic calendar, and there's reasons for that. We've gone through it. If you want to check out our in-depth teaching of the section, the prophetic calendar was 360 days. So 483 years times 360 days, that's 173,880 days. That's where I get that. Jesus is standing on the Mount of Olives exactly to the day Daniel said he was going to be there. We've got teachings on that if that interests you. Well, anyway, after that 69th week is April the 6th, 32 AD. Where is Jesus standing? Sitting on the donkey, really. He's on the Mount of Olives. They should have seen it. And that's why he wept. I was there when Daniel said I was going to be there. He is rejected. The prophetic watch stops. 69 weeks are done. How many weeks are left? One. So after the 69th week, 
Messiah shall be cut off. That is the Hebrew word karat, and it means executed for a capital offense. But not for himself. He was innocent. Can you think of somebody who was crucified and it was not his fault? That's what Daniel is prophesying. He is innocent. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city. What city? Jerusalem and the sanctuary. This is one of the places where you're going to get a little information about the Antichrist fella. He is going to become, he will come out of the people who destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD. What group of people destroyed the temple in 70 AD? The Romans. This is one of your clues that the Antichrist will trace his genealogy from the old Roman Empire. Very important. The end of it shall be with a flood. That's the Hebrew word that says pouring out. That's the term diaspora. In 70 AD, who destroyed Jerusalem and kicked out all the Jews? The Romans did. Where did they go? Throughout all of the nations of the world. For how long? 19 centuries. Until when? 1948. They came back. Until the end of the war and desolations have been determined. Verse 27. And then he, the Antichrist, shall confirm. And that word means to enforce. Have there been peace treaties in the Middle East since 1948? All kinds of them. Have any of them stuck? No. That's why the Hamas-Israeli thing is so provocative for me. No one is going to be fixed. No one is going to be able to figure it out. The nations of the world will try and try, and they have, but it's been the Lord who has been behind more or less the idea it's not time yet. When will there be a peace treaty enforced? Happens by the Antichrist, says so right here. He shall confirm or enforce a peace treaty. With the many, and we have Bible verses on that, that is Israel, for one week. How long is a week, you guys? It's seven years. This is the 70th week of Daniel. And there it is betrayed, uh, betrayed, portrayed for you right there on our map, right there. And then he, the Antichrist, will confirm, literally enforce the covenant for the many with a week, for the 70th week. Right in your margin here, Isaiah 28, verses 14 and 15. Isaiah 28, 14 and 15. We don't have time to turn there, but check it out. Did you know that Isaiah prophesied that Israel will make a covenant with the devil? Isaiah knew that it's coming. And the 70th week of Daniel does not begin until Israel says, you, Mr. Antichrist, are our Messiah. And on the day that they cut the ribbon, because that was the Antichrist's carrot for Israel to pull back from the battle of Psalm 83, they have vastly expanded, Israel has suddenly expanded her borders, and probably nukes have flown, as we looked at last week, and last Wednesday, Damascus will be a ruinous heap in an hour. Amos, pardon me, Amman, Jordan uh, is going to be a ruinous heap, a desolated mound in a very short period of time. And a number of things happen. Probably nukes. The world has gone crazy. Very likely, I believe, that um, the Antichrist is not totally revealed until he's the one who makes and enforces the covenant of peace with Israel for a week. And the church has to be gone before that happens. That's the rapture. The rapture changes everything. As I said last week, I believe the United States is going to feel the effect of millions disappearing more so than any of the other nations. I believe that America is going to be so concerned with trying to get everything back working again because how many first responders are believers? How many important military planners and leaders and military personnel are believers in Jesus Christ? How many um, in Washington or in Carson City or even off of 9th Street here in Reno, how many of them are active believers? 
America is going to be reeling from the effects of the rapture. And when that happens, I believe they will be too concerned with themselves. And now you have the Middle East blowing up in a nuclear war. That's when the Antichrist is going to come out of the old Roman Empire and say, I got a plan. And that's when Middle East peace, in quotations, is going to be signed for how long? One year. Okay, you ready? But in the middle of that week, go ahead. So there's the Antichrist peace deal for seven years. But in the middle, he's going to bring an end to the sacrifice and the offerings. Why? This is Matthew 24. This is the abomination of desolation. Go ahead. This is when the Antichrist sets up a statue of himself in the Holy of Holies. And the Jews go, wow, that's what Antiochus did. That was all a precursor. And there is now a speaking statue in the Holy of Holies in the third temple there in Jerusalem that the Antichrist got built. And then this man says, everybody better worship me. Jews, ding. Now don't forget, in the first three and a half years of the Great Tribulation, you got Moses and Elijah there in Jerusalem preaching. You could download their Bible studies probably on an app that's going to come out when that happens. And they're going to keep saying, that is not, he is not your Messiah, Jesus is. And for three and a half years, they try to kill those guys in Jerusalem, but they can't. By the way, if you know nothing else and you came across this video and somebody sent it to you, and you've been, I don't know, you had it stuck away for a while, You've heard about millions disappearing, but who knows what lie comes out of what happened. Aliens came and got us all, whatever it might be. And you see the abomination of desolation. You see an Antichrist guy proclaim himself to be God in the Holy of Holies. Get to the rock city of Petra. It's the only place that's going to be supernaturally spared. Israel, the blindness in part, comes off. And at the midpoint, Zechariah 12, verse 10, and they will look upon me whom they pierced. When was Jehovah God pierced? When he hung on a cross. And they will cry out. We covered this Wednesday. They will cry out in the book of Hosea, chapter 5, and then in Micah, chapter 2, verse 12, with such a loud voice, we missed it, Lord. A remnant gets to Petra, Basra. They get to Petra and God supernaturally protects them and they cry out to the Lord. And Jesus, Isaiah 63, verses one through four, hears and he comes back. He defeats a terrible contingency sent from the Antichrist. His robes are covered in blood. He rescues the remnant out of Petra. He says to you and I in heaven, yo, let's go. Our garments are spotless and right, white. Revelation 19, his garments are blood red. Why? Isaiah 63 verses one through four. He's been, he's come from Basra. He's come from Petra. And he wiped out Revelation 12 when he goes to Petra. And the Antichrist sent all these people and the earth opens up and swallows them up. In Revelation 19, you've probably wondered, why is his garments blood red and ours are white? Because he fought Antichrist's forces and won at Basra. We didn't fight. And down we follow him. Where does Jesus and us, where do we land on the Mount of? That's exactly 1260 days from the abomination of desolation. Jesus goes into the temple, cleanses the temple. He then heads to Armageddon, the valley of Megiddo, and he says something with a word. I'll bet it's I am. You sure? Is there a model of that in the Bible? They come to get Jesus on the night he was going to be betrayed. Whom do you seek? They said, we seek Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said, I am. And what happened to all the Roman soldiers? That is a model of Revelation chapter 19. 
all of the combatants in this terrible battle of Armageddon from Haifa all the way down to almost Petra, 180 miles, they, they were all gathered in that region because they wanted to kill Israel and all the Jews. They end up fighting each other and the blood spatters to the height of the horse's bridle because the evil of God, despite angels flying across the sky broadcasting the gospel, they're no, no. And they followed their terrible commanders to the valley of Armageddon and in one location, God, bang! Suddenly, all of the combatants against him are done. Then Matthew chapter 21, that's when the separating of the sheep and the goats happens. And then that's when the millennial reign begins. So there it is. Hit our go button if you would. The last three and a half years, Israel is saved. See Romans chapter 9 through 11. How much of Israel is saved? All of them. Is that all I have? No, I got more. Uh, go ahead, if you would. And on the wing of the abomination shall be one who makes desolate. Um, I have it on pretty good regard that that is planet Earth. How do you know that? Because it's planet Earth, all right? Hit the go button. Right here is a little piece of land that God has said since Abraham. Keep an eye on this place. Keep an eye right there. Israel is my chosen people, not because I think they're cooler. Israel is my chosen people because watch them. When they obey what I say, it goes well for them and they're supernaturally protected and blessed. When they throw off my word and do it their own way and do what's right in their own eyes, I take my safety away from them and, safety away from them, and then the devil will systematically go after the Jews. He always has. When they were in Egypt, did Pharaoh issue a decree to kill all the male Jewish babies? Did Herod the Great order the, de the death of all the boys in Bethlehem under the age of two? Um, how many times has evil, evil people gone after the systematic extermination of the Jews? Please hear me and I stand by it. Anti-Semitism in any form had its origins in hell with Satan. Have the Jews always behaved themselves in model fashion? No. But God says, you watch that little bit of ground. You watch what happens there and keep your eyes on the people. And when they act up, it's my job to correct them. And he does. He sends them for 70 years in Babylon. That didn't stop the idle itch. And then they reject Jesus as Messiah. And he wept and he said, oh, you don't know what you have set in motion, Israel. Because in 38 years are going to come the Romans and they're going to scatter you throughout all the earth. And it happened. But in May 14th, 1948, they come back again. Go ahead. Go ahead. Is that or is that not a map of Israel? Harvest or anybody watching by video, is there a nation on this planet by the name of Israel? Hold up your Bible. Go ahead. Hold it right up. Do you believe him now? Amen? All right. Hit the go button. Isaiah 66, verse 8. Who has heard of such a thing? Who has seen such things? 700 BC. Shall the earth be made to give birth in a day? Or shall a nation be born at once? Can a nation be born in one day? 700 BC, no. So as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children, the nation of Israel. Hit the go button. I'm going to go quickly. You guys, this was May 15th, 1948. That is a headline. Israel becomes a nation in one day. Do you see that with me? Are you actually seeing that with your own eyes? Yes, that is the most substantial, fulfilled Bible prophecy in the entire Bible. And Daniel says, Jesus says, that the generation that sees this happen shall not all pass away until Jesus steps on the Mount of Olives again, Revelation 19.